Next up on the keynote stage, we have second studio podcast hosts, Marina Bordernay and David Lee, joined by Rio's co-founders, Jessamine Davis and Andy Lance for our opening keynote, Silver Linings, Audacity and Joy, the new practice playbook. Please welcome our speakers to the stage. Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, are we all in? I think so. I think we made it. Yeah, awesome. Uh, thanks, uh, Monograph, for having us. Uh, Marina and I are super stoked to be here and really excited to speak with Rios. We have some great questions for you guys, and I'm very curious to hear the answers. So I'm, I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Same with us. Super excited to be here this morning. So I'll give a little bit of introduction um, to Jessamine Davis. Um, Jessamine Davis is uh, the co-CEO of Rios, and she is responsible for the growth and financial vitality of the practice. Uh, she oversees the health of finance and business operations and also the realization of strategic planning goals. After joining the firm in 2015, as their first CFO, she created the infrastructure to catalyze sustainable and scalable growth among the studio's many disciplines. She drives the creation of processes and procedures that direct and support overall firm operations. Jessamine's diverse background spans biotech to renewable energy to extreme sports, mm -hmm, which, strengthens <laughs> and, <laughs> which strengthens the entrepreneurial drive between, uh, behind Rios. In addition to her role within practice, she also serves as the CFO of Not Neutral, the Rios sister company that focuses on tabletop products. And Andy Lance is an architect and visionary leader directing groundbreaking design solution as co-CEO at Rios. His depth of experience is all-encompassing in multidisciplinary design as um, he influences the team across the firm with his perspective and his point of view for our, our uh, achieving dynamic experiences through design. For over a decade, Andy's work has served as uh, an impressive roster of clients and projects from competition winning places that enhance the public realm along the Sunset Strip in West Hollywood and along the banks of Lady Bird Lake in Austin, Texas, to notable music institution and content production facilities in LA, and to leading the industry in envisioning the future of work with market-ready products and forward-thinking design approaches that reframe the potential in workplace design. So starting off, one of the first things is that I, I would say having two CEOs, having co-CEOs is not very common in architecture, I don't think. So can you walk us through the strategy behind structuring it that way? And how do you both work together and then with the rest of your company? Sure. I think it was a pretty natural um, organization structure for us. Actually, I am not a designer by uh, training. And so I think it's super, super important for us to have um, a leader that speaks to design excellence, particularly and inspires the vast majority of our staff that focus on that every day. Um, my background and training is really in business management, which is also pretty natural for someone who's running a business. So, um, you know, Andy and I work really well together and we have really complementary skill sets. So it actually, it's, it's, pretty fun. It's pretty great. And it's always really nice to have someone to bounce ideas off of and to coordinate with and to cover for you and all that kind of stuff. Definitely. And, you know, I think for us, uh, finding agility and how we manage business operation is kind of really important to who we are as a practice. Um, I think we spend a lot of time really putting focus into designing our own selves. Our founder, Mark Rios, really uh, implements a belief that our best design project is designing ourselves. And so uh, we test a lot of different concepts with how to run the business and the co-CEO structure has been really great at putting a little bit more energy into pushing strategy coming out of a really, you know, challenging year that we all experienced um, last year uh, and really reimagining uh, coming back to work and, and thinking forward instead of looking at the current situation. So um, it's been a great structure for us to really uh, put momentum in, in getting into new places. So besides the co-CEO structure, do you guys have any other unique organizational structures that you've established in the office? Yeah, you know, uh, as a part of our co-CEO um, uh, idea, we implemented a group of people that we call the management committee. One of the things that we're really focused on doing is, is raising future leaders. Um, our success is not only captured by the partners of the office, but by the people who participate in it. So the management structure is really great. It pulls together a couple uh, people from all different levels in the office um, and puts them in a position of having to make 
uh, hard business operation decisions with Jessamine and myself. Um, so that's been a really awesome opportunity to really provide mentorship through um, reviewing all aspects of you know staffing and performance and new projects and new markets. Um, so that's one really great example. I think Jessamine can probably talk about a couple more. Yeah, I think you know we really set strategy with our senior leadership team with our partners, our business partners, as well as our studio directors. But what we found, especially over the last year, is that if we can harness the grassroots um, passions of our wider team, we can cover a lot more ground. So we have a pretty diverse group of people focused on DEI and um, social equity. I'd say there's maybe 20 people across three or four different committees that are focusing on things like community outreach, diverse recruiting, scholarships, um, providing pathways for leadership in the industry for lots of different people. And it's been incredible to watch the ground that they've covered over the last year. And so we're taking the success that we've um, seen with that team and kind of replicating it with our climate action group as well. And so there's people um, working from all different studios together, which gives them the chance to build bridges across the office as our office is getting bigger. Um, it gives us a chance to get to know some of the younger staff who are really passionate, who maybe we don't work with on a day-to-day -day basis because of the type um, of work we do or whatever. And it's really, um, it's just, it's been a great opportunity to build mentorship in different teams. Wow, you guys are busy. Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> so what's also really interesting is that uh, we had learned that Rios has a set of six core values, and I'm going to list them now. There's joy, inclusivity, audacity, originality, attunement, and resiliency. Um, so I was wondering, like, how are these values established and how do they exist or flow throughout the company? Definitely. You know, um, one of our biggest assets as a design firm is that we really try to foster diversity and expression. I think if you were to look at our portfolio, you'd probably see a, a, a wide range of points of view. And that comes directly from empowering our staff to really have impact on the projects we work on. Um, during COVID last year, we, we realized a lot of the day to day was focused on getting from one day to the next day and sort of coming out of COVID and imagining working in a new world. We wanted to really amplify everybody's energy towards a collective understanding of our most significant and successful attributes. So these core values become a collective way for us to come together to critique and review the work and to really um, put front and center our belief system and how it influences uh, the designs that we produce. So one of your core values is audacity. And I'm wondering, like, how do you nurture the entrepreneurial drive and opportunity for Rios and the team? Yeah, that's a great question. I think there's a couple of things that's incredibly important to us. There's no point in doing work that is boring or similar or, you know, that's been done before. It's just there's not it's not interesting for us. And so we uh, have an incredibly entrepreneurial culture. We, each of our um, groups is set up as sort of like a small business. So I would say we have 12 small businesses run in our company, each with a business head that uh, is really responsible for its financial performance, but also in pushing it. They all have unique perspectives of where they want their studios to go and what kind of work they are interested in pursuing. And we really try to be a platform for harnessing their career and their passion. Um, but and on top of that, we really don't... Um, penalize failure. So what we really love to see is people coming with creative new ideas. And if lots of things aren't going to work, most things aren't going to work. But if you celebrate, you know, the bravery of trying and a few things will work and we carry those forward with more passion, it's really, really important to give people that safe space to be trying new things. Hmm. And you might have said this already, but um, as background, so how many people are in the office? Remind us again. We officially, as of Monday, will be at 225. It uh, changes every day. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> sure. And so okay, that's the size of the office. And so how many of these are designers versus business mm. um, staff? You know, it's about, I don't. I couldn't give you an exact number. It's about 80% design, maybe 20% I would call back office or support staff. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Oh, very interesting. Yeah. So then staying on the theme of audacity, um, I have two questions, actually. The first is, what are the extreme sports you do, Jessica? Because <laughs> I think I everyone's wondering. I, that. <laughs> I feel like we have to cover it, right? Um, and then the second question is, um, could you guys share any specific examples of how um, working with bold or risk-taking ways led to you know, cool solutions or better outcomes? 
Okay, well, starting, let me just address the extreme sports <laughs> question first. So my background is in marketing extreme sports, actually not in doing them. But, okay. um, you know, I'm from L.A., so what teenager doesn't grow up surfing in Los Angeles, right? But also, you know, Andy is more of the extreme sports person, actually, than I am. I know. I'm a big wave surfer fan. I don't do it. I, am I was sure. actually thinking more of skateboard. <laughs> or I did skateboard as a kid. Yeah. Oh, you just a kid. I think throw my back out now, but yeah, be out for a few months. Um, You know, I think all that counts. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Audacity for us is a super powerful, powerful word. I think it describes sort of sitting on the cusp of either being super successful at wild ideas or failing and learning from wild ideas. And we're really lucky that we have some really outstanding clients that come to us, and you know. One of our biggest passions is to really break down the boundary between us as professionals and the clients we bring in um, and sort of really building collaborative teams where the client's participating in design, whether that's jumping into a Murrow board and putting comments or putting imagery or putting ideas. Um, that, you know, We try to get clients as engaged and active during uh, the development of projects just so that they can really sort of be attuned to the way that we're thinking through the ideas we're proposing. We really love to reframe challenges. So when a client comes to us with one idea, we try to look at it as a collection of challenges and a collection of great ideas um, to really amplify the potential of the work. And so um, we really like to push our clients to be a little bit more calculated in their risk taking and think bigger and broader beyond uh, you know, the, the, the single challenge they may have come to us with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Another one of the, the core value of your office is joy. And I feel like it's a little bit unexpected from, you know, an office. Um, <laughs> how have you guys shaped the working culture at, at the office to promote joy throughout the design process, but also your practice operations? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of what we're all about, to be honest. I mean, you can tell we're, we love to have fun at work. It's again, what's the point otherwise? Um, I think the biggest thing is that we treat our employees like family or really, really good friends. We don't act formally together in any way. We bring our whole self to work and we expect everyone to, um, which can be a little off putting at first, maybe. Um, but, you know, we try to like, for example, last year we couldn't have a holiday party. And so each of our partners and our senior leaders took a group of people and we drove to each of their house and we dropped them off food and we dropped them off a gift just so that we could be more human together. Um, and then we had a party online, which was kind of a bummer, but it was more fun because we got to see each other. Um, and we do stuff like that a lot. We really focus on our culture to make sure that, you know, we're having, we have live stream DJs for our staff and, you know, we do a lot of things to try to keep it more fun and more human and real. I think, I think with joy comes optimism. And I think a lot of the energy coming out of last year was kind of flipping the script and saying, you know, where do we head from here and how can we really take advantage of a lot of the revolutions that we're seeing in the ideas of design? Um, Joy to us means empowering and enlivening the the lives of the people who engage our work and experience our work and knowing that we want to try to bring that energy, whether it's through color and mural or through, you know, vibrancy and form, uh, we definitely feel that it's a really important factor that not a lot of people talk about in regard to place making public space and sort of experiences that we put out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I think having that as a core principle is is just amazing. I mean, it makes a big difference. And and also, like, why not have joy be one of them? Like, you know, we're going to show up to work every day. You might as well have some fun, right? Right. Exactly. So the other thing that's a little bit different or unique with you guys is you're a very multidisciplinary office. So how does that come into play with all of this kind of discussion? It is. It's the outstanding part of everything that we do. We have Um, you know, landscape architects, product designers, graphic designers, interior designers and interior architects um, and architects in office, um, as well as, you know, entrepreneurs who are, you know, thinking through a lot of different ways to imagine the future of business. And bringing all of that together just makes this amazing tool set to really have a diverse collection of perspectives on how to think, how to solve problems and to really, you know, think big and put big ideas out there Uh, in really powerful ways. It allows us to also break rules more frequently, right? Um, A lot of the the learning curve of coming to Rios is is realizing how to break the boundaries of your discipline, how to, as an architect, think as a landscape architect, or as a landscape architect, think as a product designer. 
Um, and, you know, that's the freedom you get with a multidisciplinary practice is you get to sort of move out of your lane uh, and realize breaking the rules is an exciting thing. Hmm. Uh, talking about the multidisciplinary, you guys have a, a sister company of Rios uh, that was started that is called Not Neutral. Uh, and I think that's a very good example of a multidisciplinary practice spinning off from a main one, right? How did you guys start this practice and how does uh, your practice operations are different from the ones you have at Rios? Yeah, that's a great example. When Not Neutral was started, actually coming out of a Rios project, there was a restaurant that the firm designed and they needed tableware. And so Rios designed tableware with the same graphic patterns that we were using in the space. And um, and so it was the first time we'd ever designed a product and it was so fun and it was um kind of inspiring. And out of that grew an entire company focused on tableware. And since that time, um, not neutrals become incredibly focused actually on coffeeware. Uh, and that came through another collaboration that was really successful um, with an outside company. And Today, they operate pretty independently because a product company is inherently pretty different from um, a design firm that's providing kind of like a service versus a product. You know, the distribution channels are completely different. The marketing process is different, um, but we work in the same space and, you know, we're all very, very close. And there are Rios designers that, you know, always want to moonlight and put stuff together for not neutral, particularly graphic patterns and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's a, it's, it's a different business, I would say. Same heart. Sure. It's really interesting. There's, I've heard of a couple of different architecture and design offices that have kind of two identities to it or two separate businesses officially. And I would imagine, and maybe you guys could answer this, is like one of the benefits, um, like more financial stability, because if projects aren't coming in, then you have this other source that kind of can make things stay afloat or keep moving forward. I think that um, designers like often um, think that that's going to be the case. Like, I think that that's a common storyline that people who have to make an hourly, you know, have to make their wage by showing up for work, think that they're going to develop this product and it's going to sell forever, like an air yeah. on chair and, you know, be their retirement yeah. kind of thing. Um, I think that for the vast majority of people, that's probably not true, to be honest. Um, they, it is a stable income in the sense that Not Neutral has customers all over the world. Um, we primarily sell to small coffee shops in shops literally on every continent in every country you can imagine. Um, and so in the sense that when things, uh, particularly during the pandemic, you know, American coffee shops were certainly not the place people were going, but they were really still open in Asia and they were still really open in the Middle East. And those businesses grew for us and during that time. And so um, in that sense, it's much more stable, but it's just it's just a different it's a totally different animal with its own challenges. Right, right. Interesting. Maybe not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> no, it's work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then on the theme or topic of silver linings, right? Um, what is like the process that you guys go through to try and find the silver lining in the unknown or in a, the adventure in the under, uh, undiscovered? Um, like how do you harness, you know, that instead of like resisting change? Right. You know, I think we lead by example with how we run the business that we try to be as agile as possible. Um, finding equilibrium usually is something we run away from where, you know, pursuing change and, in, and reinventing on a daily, sometimes hourly basis, um, although it sounds chaotic, is, is something we're very sort of passionate about. Um, I think, you know, learning from our industry, it kind of takes a, a very different way of looking at it in being successful, I think, especially with the past year coming out of COVID. Um, we spent a lot of time really focused in from day to day on, on what the, the existing challenge was. And we never really pushed ourselves to sort of break out of that and dream of the future coming out of it. And I think when we did that, um, we started to look around at a lot of our colleagues across the discipline who were having a hard time making that transition, embracing that change and, and embracing a new future. And I think for us, that's where we find our uh, excitement in business is really dreaming of how things can you know be malleable and how things can really evolve uh, over time and inspiring people to think that way um, i think as we imagine all of the future hurdles that we'll have whether it's climate change 
um, social justice. Um, I, I think we all have to get accustomed to realizing that we're constantly evolving and it's not about trying to prefer, uh, preserve the status, status quo. Mm -hmm. Is there any other smaller silver lining that you guys discovered through, you know, going through 2021, 2020 last year, and it was, you know, a pretty uh, atypical year? I um, mean, you mentioned change, which is definitely a huge one. Is there like smaller ones maybe that, that you've discovered too? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, kind of the way that I, I, we've allowed our staff particularly to be kind of unleashed on the planet, which is really fun um, for us. You know, we've really relaxed any requirement that people be physically in Los Angeles. And it's been amazing because our staff is incredibly diverse and they have a lot of global origins. It's been sort of humanizing, I would say, for people to be able to go spend a month in the summer with their parents that they haven't been able to do since before college. Um, and they're in a lot of cases on the other side of the planet. And that's great. Or to live their dream and, you know, spend a year in Milan. Right. Um, and it, it gives us a lot of more interesting perspectives for our work. And um, it's also allowed, you know, frankly, from a recruiting standpoint, opened up a lot of um, amazing candidates who aren't maybe necessarily interested in living in Los Angeles. Or they've got family mm -hmm. somewhere else. They're already settled, whatever. Um, we're kind of open to that now. And it's um, something we wouldn't have considered before. I wish my boss would let me work from Milan, but uh, oh, no, wish. Uh, <laughs> hint, hint. Um, Just complain then, to HR, David. <laughs> you are HR. It doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, on the topic of playbooks, which I think is really interesting. So one of the big ideas in this conference is working on the business as opposed to just working in the business. And you guys had said earlier or was mentioned earlier that you really think about um, designing the business like a project almost. Right. Like that's that's the thing is designing the business. So what's your thinking about creating playbooks? Like what is a playbook for a business and what is your specific playbook um, at Rios? I think we write it in pencil so we can quickly erase it. <laughs> um, you know, I think, uh, as you've probably heard us mention multiple times, you know, this idea of being agile and this idea of embracing change and this idea of empowering people to participate in being entrepreneurs um, and feeling empowered to make decisions and take risks. I think our playbook is probably playbooks and is probably done in a very uh, sort of pencil drawn way where we can quickly make corrections and quickly yeah. evolve it as we go. I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, like we don't have a five year strategy plan that is sort of, you know, laying out what the steps are for people. We have like a three things we're trying to get done this year that are guiding our senior leaders. And we reiterate to them a lot, like, don't forget, this is what we're trying to get done. And but because they're such short term goals, it makes it uh, there's an immediacy and a um, to, to getting things done rather than, you know, talking and kind of grand visions. We really know very specifically what um, each team is trying to accomplish. And we just have to really reiterate that over and over and over again, because I kind of realized this year you can you can never communicate too much. For sure. Yeah, for and sure. And getting to, to one of the questions that popped in that's sort of related to this, um, a question from Mark Daniels is, what systems do you have in place to help your staff or team grow to the next level? I think, you know, um, from an operations perspective, we have a super robust uh, system in place that really brings front and center transparent access to data. Mm -hmm. um, we love data we believe in data we have a lot of people focused on that data and so i think you know imagining um being a business manager or a business owner at the scale of a studio you can really see big picture everything from staffing to project success and performance and understand sort of how to make really really great decisions um, or to take risks and maybe uh, learn from things that didn't go the way that you thought they went I think there's also a lot of direct communication, as Jessamine just mentioned. Um, we love to make sure people have a connection through mentorship, not only with us and our other partners, um, but with a lot of our senior leadership as well. Yeah, so we, you know, to Andy's point, um, we each, each studio leader meets with every staff member at least quarterly to discuss their career goals and how those are going, which is kind of a big investment in time. Um, and then we have, I meet with each studio leader on a monthly basis to just review everything in terms of how their studio is doing from a financial standpoint, from a staffing standpoint, all that, those kind of things. Um, and then the studio 
studios individually have the opportunity to provide their leaders feedback also um, in a couple different ways. And so we just really try to keep the communication really active and regular. On the topic of finance, because we're talking about business and, you know, finance, um, I feel like many designers think that, uh, you know, maybe finance goes in conflict with design or that they think that that decreases design opportunities. Um, how do you guys feel about that? And, you know, how do you think maybe finance can actually increase opportunities in design? I guess I reject the premise a little bit. Um, I think that to be honest, you get paid more when you do really good work. And so if you really squeeze teams not to spend time on their work, you're gonna do mediocre work and that's how you're gonna be treated in the market. Good answer. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a period, beautifully yeah. answered. Um, so another question we got from a, a, one of the listeners or watchers, I guess, is from Sarah Kudra, and she asks, does the core value of joy draw clients who also feel the same way? Um, has that particular value or even others yeah. opened doors to better work and uh, more experimental clients? Um, I think if you want to go into a space and really draw the attention of people, it's usually by talking differently than what everybody else is talking about. And joy for us is a head turner. Um, it definitely is a, a term and a value that I, I really want to stick long term just because the second that you start reframing the success of projects around bringing joy to the future occupants is the second that you capture someone's imagination from a client perspective or from a collaborator um, or even from a consultant perspective. Um, I think it's definitely brought people to us, not only see, seeing us talk about it, but actually seeing it in the work that we're doing. Um, and, and how it's influencing the, the people or the patrons who are experiencing our work, it definitely is an awesome way um, to change the nature of conversation and, and bring equity and involvement. Joy is a very human thing we all can talk about. It's not a challenging architectural or design term. It's something that is human by nature, um, and everybody has some understanding of what it feels like. And so um, it's a great way to really engage as many people as possible in the conversation of design. That's great. And I know that you guys are actually actively hiring right now. So what are some of the qualities you look for in a prospective employee? And has that criteria changed over time? Um, you know, learning from this past year, our biggest thing that we're focused on is really disassociating the portfolio from the person. So much of our industry is portfolio based and it's really unnerving when you think about it that I send a portfolio and that's supposed to be everything I am as a human being. Um, and there's not an equity in, in understanding people's experiences while they're in school. Um, were they juggling a job full time to pay for school while they were in it? So one of the biggest things we try to do is set up multiple interviews where we, you know, quickly tell candidates. Let's be informal. We're not going to do a page turn of your work. Like, let's talk about your life. Like, where have you seen challenges? How have you overcome them? What are your passions? Um, my favorite question to ask somebody is, who do you, who are you uh, in five years? Um, just so that we can really see how the their aspirations align to opportunities in the office mm -hmm. um, and definitely understand how culturally they can fit in and sort of flourish within the environment. Um, as we've mentioned, we're, we're fast moving, we're agile, we're constantly changing, and it takes uh, really strong people who wanna participate in that culture um, and be inspired by it. So that's a lot of what we do during our interview processes. Oh, that's great. And uh, that's perfect because we just hit the 840 mark and in and, and, and our time, at least in California. Did you guys have any closing remarks before we move on to the next thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, totally awesome for you guys to have us here today. Yeah. Um, I think our passion is really talking about business operations on a daily basis. Um, and so it's exciting to be talking about this and be talking about where we're all heading uh, and really redefining our industry for the future. So um, thank you guys for this opportunity. This is a great event. Thank you so much to Monograph. Thank you so, so, so much. I could not get enough of how open and supportive the conversation was around inclusivity, empowerment, and fun. That's what we're all about. My, per my personal core value would definitely be audacity, be bold, make a statement, leave your mark. I'm all about it. Perfect. Love it. Thank you all so much. It was a pleasure having you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you, guys.